Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. We are in this series called Already and Not Yet. Our key text for this scripture uh, series comes out of Ephesians 1, 7. It says, in him we have redemption. So we could also say this. In him we already have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. This is if you accepted Jesus Christ. As a believer, we have redemption through his blood. Redemption refers to the work of Christ on our behalf whereby he purchased us and ransomed us at the price of his own life. The Bible does say, for the wages of sin is death. So the only payment for sin is death. Therefore, Christ died on our behalf that we may have life eternal. He paid the price for sin. And I made a comment first service, a little controversial, controversial, but uh, what Jesus did for us, if we talked about it today, is the law of double jeopardy. The law of double jeopardy says no one can be tried for the same crime twice. So if Christ forgave you all of your sin, past, present, and future, you cannot be charged with sin again because Christ paid the price for that in his body on the tree. Him who knew no sin became sin that we might be made something else. We are not sin. We've been made the righteous of God in Christ Jesus. Jesus. I mean, we can debate that all day long. I love debating. I love arguing. It's one of my love languages. So if you ever want to sit down and have a good Bible study, we can do that. So we've been talking about this already and not yet. And we took a lot of time. We talked about what has already happened. What is our position in Christ? And we've talked about the in-between. What should we do? How should we live our lives? Understanding the kingdom of God. But what we haven't talked about yet and what a lot of churches don't talk about is what has not yet happened. What is going to happen in the time called the eschaton or the end times? What's going to happen when we go to heaven? And to set your mind at ease, my point is not to scare the tar out of you or scare the sin out of you or scare the hell out of you. Get that, hell? Okay. Okay. It really is for us to do a study. Let's look at what the Bible says. I'm the person. I like to create things. I like to invent things. And in anything I ever invent, you can ask my team, I sit down and I draw the end product. I draw out what I want to create. What do I want the final product to look like? And then I reverse engineer to where I am, what I have, and how I'm going to get to that place. And I think that looking at the end times is a great way to reverse engineer our lives, to live life on purpose, to say, if that's where I'm going to go, if that's what's going to happen, how do I ensure that I have the best place and best opportunity when I get there? And that's what the hope of today is. We're going to talk about a term in the Bible called the final judgment. The final judgment. And I will tell you, as a kid, this stuff scared me silly. End judgment, what is it? And I had a wrong theology, something that I taught for years that was incorrect. I used to teach that Christians, when they go to heaven, that they go to the throne of grace and everyone else goes to a throne of judgment. And I was wrong. I had to study this out. Uh, the Bible doesn't say that when we get to heaven, we're going to go to a throne of grace. In fact, the throne of grace is a place that we can go right now in prayer. We can go to the place, the, the throne of grace right now in prayer. And here's the verses. And we are a Bible-based church, which means that we find the scriptures, we preach the scriptures, we dissect the scriptures and find the truth, okay? So Hebrews 4.14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. So that's a pretty important sentence right there. If you say you believe in God, if you say you believe in Christianity, then hold fast to that faith. Do the things that come into that faith. 
For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Therefore, verse 16, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Now, if this was in heaven, we're not going to have a time of need. There's not going to be any need in heaven. You're gonna, everything's going to be fulfilled. Everything's going to be finished. So this is telling us now, here in the now, when you need help, when you need mercy, when you need grace, go to his throne of grace in prayer. Okay? So this is part of the Christian life. This should be part of your daily habits of when you pray, that you go into the throne of grace. But there is something that happens in the end times. There is something happens when we go to heaven. And what I'm about to say, I'm completely making up, okay? But it's just how my mind works. At some point, we're all going to die, whether, it's, whether you believe in the rapture, you believe, doo, 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 Trump's going to sound, we're all going to go. How, however we all get there, everybody on earth's going to heaven. Everybody on earth's going to heaven. Not everybody's going to stay there, but everyone's going to go to heaven. And I think, here's what I'm making up, we're going to go to the pearling white gates, right? The gates, I think St. Peter's going to be standing there. You have this book, and he's going to be like, uh, Mike McKelvey, born 1979 in Delaware. Yep, got your name. Oh, there's your name, written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You have eternal life. Come onto this line. And then Bob Jones comes up. He says, oh, Bob Jones, born 1962. Uh, I can see your birth date, but I don't see your rebirth date. You got to go this line. I think there's these two lines, right? One line is going to go to the judgment seat of Christ, and one line is going to go to the great white throne of judgment. So I made all that up. I don't really know how that's going to go down. But let's look at Scripture and see what it says. Okay, I created a chart that there are going to be two different experiences in heaven, one for the believers and one for the unbelievers. Those who put their faith in Jesus here in this life and those who rejected Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So let's first talk about the believers because that's who we are. That's our room. That's our audience. Romans 14.10 says this. You then, you then, dear brothers and sisters, uh, why do you judge your brother or your sister? Whew, man, that's such a tough one, right? Basically, he's saying, stop judging everybody. Stop judging other people's behavior. Stop judging everyone's lifestyle. Stop judging everyone's politics. I'm sure someone got into a political debate at Thanksgiving dinner. Right? Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me. Every tongue will acknowledge God. So then each of us will give an account for ourselves to God. As a kid, you see something like that, and you're like, that's scary. I'm going to give an account for everything that I did. Like, what happened to the whole forgiveness of sins? What happened to he throws your sin into the sea of forgetfulness? Like, what the heck? Now i got to go give an account for this after I've already been told that it, all right? So we have to understand the Christian experience, the, the believer experience is going to be different than the unbeliever. And that is not saying that you're going to give an account for sin. What it is saying is you are going to give an account for what you did for the gospel. What did you do as a believer for the gospel? What works did you do for the gospel? And those actions are going to be judged. The judgment seat is a place that believers will go and stand before God to give an account for what they have done in this life for the gospel. Say, for the gospel. Okay, for the gospel. Now, again, I will say this. You do not have to believe anything I say today. You do not have to agree with anything I say today. That's the beauty and the ugliness of theology. We can look at scriptures and make them say whatever we want. Okay? We're just going line by line and just looking at this stuff today. 1 Corinthians 3.13, Paul is speaking of the works that we have done in our lives for the gospel. And he says this. Their works will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light, 
it will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's works. Okay? What is this saying to us? This is saying the things that you did for the gospel will be tested for what your intentions were. Okay, you sign up for one of our local outreaches, and you're going to go help uh, serve people at the soup kitchen. And the entire time you're feeding people at the soup kitchen, you're taking selfies. Oh, I love my neighbor. I'm helping the poor. Look at me. Oh, my God. Look how great I am. Your intentions for doing it were not for the people. It was for your image. It was so that you looked like you were someone who cared, but you didn't really care. You just needed more likes on your Instagram feed, right? So that work, as it's tried by fire, right, as it goes through, says, okay, listen, yeah, let's look at all these things that you did for the gospel, all the outreach you did, the mission trips. Why did you do them? What was your intentions? What was your heartbeat? And, and there's going to be parts of it that are going to be burned up in the fire, but the parts that are not burned up in the fire, the things that you did do in righteousness, the things that you did do with the right heart will be accounted unto you as righteous or for righteousness sake. The Bible says that the things that we do in this life store treasure in heaven. But how do you know how much treasure you have unless we take account? There's got to be a way that the things that we do are accounted Four. So we stand before God, our works are tested by fire, the things that we did that were not godly, that, that did not meet the criteria, are going to burn up in the fire, the things that we did with the wrong intentions, but the parts, the things that we did do with a pure heart that aligned with God will be accounted unto you. 2 Corinthians 5.10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due for, to us, or do us, for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Okay, now that can be scary too. Well, look, I'm going to receive this judgment on me for the things that I did bad. The bad's going to burn up. The bad thing's going to burn up. That's, that's the glorious aspect of the Christian experience. The bad thing's going to burn up. But the things that you did that are good are going to be accounted unto you. What is due you storing treasure in heaven? Now, why does the room get quiet and why do we get a little sketchy? It's because for some reason, Christians carry around a lot of guilt and shame. The very thing that we were supposed to be set free from, Romans 8.1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Yet, we carry around our own condemnation. We carry around all these things that we think, I'm not doing enough for God. I'm not a good enough Christian. I haven't read my Bible enough. I don't pray enough. I don't spend enough time in the word or in the church. And, and we had, you know, I lied and I said that I was sick and I wasn't sick and I took PTO and I got... Uh, we had this guilt. I know what I did in my life. And I gotta give account for all those things. The experience for a believer and a non-believer are going to be different. So I want to go through this with you. Let's look at the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ is the place that all believers will go. First, we know this. The judge that is going to judge you is Christ himself. Jesus Christ is the judge. The judgment seat of Christ is for believers. And what's the purpose? See, I love... When I, when I create programs, events, initiatives, I always start with writing a purpose. The purpose is the generalized idea of what I hope to accomplish with what, what I'm going to do. Then I set goals. Goals are measurable actions that I can see if I met that purpose. And so we need to know what the purpose of this judgment seat of Christ is. The purpose of the judgment seat of Christ, now listen to me. The purpose of the judgment seat of Christ is to reward the faithful service of God's children. If you look at it as a negative, it becomes this scary thing. But listen, when your kids, you take your kids to an arcade, and they get those little tickets that come out of the machine, right? You just spent $500 for them to get 10 tickets. <laughs> right? Your kids are so happy, maybe even you, 
at 45 years old. You're so happy to take those tickets and go to that little, you know, little toy store and see what can I get with these five tickets, these 10 tickets, these 10,000 tickets, and you're looking, what's my reward for these tickets that I have? Nowhere, nowhere in that whole experience does the person behind the counter say, well, how about all the games you lost? You tried to pick up that stuffed animal 30,000 times and you missed it. 30,000 times. No, you're not giving an account for, for, for the tickets that you didn't get. It's the reward seat. It's the reward store. What did you do that God can reward you for in the, in the flesh? If we don't give an account, we can't tally it up. We don't know what rewards we have in heaven. So what's the judgment criteria and, and, and here's the part that is hard for us to fathom. Here's the judgment criteria. Ready? There is therefore now no condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation. And I want to I build off of Romans 8.1 for a minute because many of us have read translations or you've been taught translations that had been adjusted. There's a couple translations where they were going through the original text and they were reading it out and they're saying, this is just too good. This is just too good. This, we, we've got to make people understand that it's not this simple. So in some translations it says in Romans 8.1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. In other translations it says this, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who follow after the spirit and not after the flesh. See, we had that do this add-on. The, the, the writers or the translators put this little add-on to say, well, if you want this, you got to make sure you're doing this. But that, that was not the intention of God's heart when he wrote it. There is, therefore now, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. The criteria, faithful believers will receive rewards for their service to God, period. Will each person receive equal treatment? Each person's motives, desires, and reasons for serving God will be judged. And that's on an individual basis. My desires, my reasons, my motives for serving God are going to look different than yours. So it's not going to be the same. It's going to be based on a relationship. I have three children, three kids that have three different personalities. Three kids that I deal with, I speak with, and I discipline differently because of their personalities. And this is how it's going to be. I don't know why you did what you did. But works rooted in pure motives will be rewarded. Works done not in pure motives, they're going to burn up, the Bible says. Will it be fair? No. No, nope, it won't be fair and I promise you, you don't want it to be fair. The law was fair. The Old Testament law was fair. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. You slap me, I slap you. That was fair. The judgment that we receive at the judgment seat of Christ is not fair. Because it's not based on you, it's based on Jesus. Jesus. We will all stand, as believers, we will stand blameless before the throne of Christ because of Jesus' righteousness, which delivers you from the punishment that sin deserves. Again, if this is one of, if this is one of those moments where you're like, I can't accept this, this is just too good. I, I don't understand why, why we would think this is too good. Like, I don't understand why you don't want to serve an amazing, loving, caring God who put in place a way that we can have eternal life without condemnation. Right? We, we think it's harder than it is. So no, it's not going to be fair. And trust me, you don't want fair. If you wanted fair, if you wanted fair, let's think about it like this. On Thursday... You're running late to the family dinner. You made the turkey. You got the turkey in the car. You're running late. So you're driving 95 miles an hour on the highway. 
cop pulls you over. He says, do you know why I pulled you over? No, officer, I have no idea why he pulled me over. I clocked you doing 80 miles an hour. You know you were doing 95. I clocked you doing 80 miles an hour. Well, sir, you don't understand. I'm running late for Thanksgiving. All my family's there. I have the turkey. You're trying to talk your whole way out of it. If you wanted fair, you'd have said, sir, I wasn't driving 80. I was driving 95. And I deserve the full penalty of the law of a 95 mile an hour ticket in a 30 mile an hour zone. But you don't want fair. You want mercy. You want grace. You want that officer to say, honey, I've been late before. I completely understand. If I was a turkey, my mom would beat me like you're going to get beat. So you know what? I'm going to let you go ahead and go. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Lord. You don't want to stand there and be judged fairly. You want to be judged through grace. You do. We all do. Come on. We all do. But it's so hard for us to extend that to other human beings who piss us off. It's so hard to extend. I'm sorry, I said pissed. It's so hard to extend grace and mercy to other human beings who sin differently than us. We all sin. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But you think that your sin is hideable. You delete your internet history. You put a little bit of cologne on so no one can smell what you've been doing. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. But someone whose lifestyle is on display, that's an abomination. That's an abomination. We judge other people. We judge their actions and their deeds based upon our own struggles, and we say, well, I don't have that problem. They shouldn't have that problem. Why was it stop judging everybody? We're all going to stand before God. Maybe you've seen the, a sign or, or a tattoo, only God is my judge, right? Well, no, the courts are judged too, but I'm just saying, we need to be very careful judging other people because they sin differently the way that we do. The judgment seat of Christ is for believers to receive their rewards. It is not the place of non-believers. Non-believers go to a different place. Now, if I was going to scare you, this joint gets scary. Okay? Because then we got to go look at the book of Revelation. And the book of Revelation is just scary. The whole book of Revelation is scary. I don't care what part it is. The whole book of Revelation is just wild. Okay? And in Revelation verse 20, uh, chapter 20, verse 11... John is speaking, he's having this, he doesn't know whether he's in the spirit or out of the spirit or in his body or out of his body. He don't know what this vision is that he's having, but he says, then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Okay. Verse 15, anyone whose name was not found in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. I'll tell you what, I like fire. I love fire. I love bonfires. I love making s'mores. I like starting fires. I like trying to start fires outside from sticks or twigs and all that kind of stuff. Even Thanksgiving, you go get a Duraflame log, put it in your fireplace because you like the ambiance of a fire in your house. But I don't want to live in fire. I don't want to be thrown in lava. Right? Like, listen, one time, one time I tried to take a shower with my wife. It's biblical. We're allowed to do that. But mi esposa es poriqua. She's Puerto Rican. I don't know if you know what that means. It means that they have no skin sensitivity to hot water. They take showers so hot 
that the steam is dripping off the ceiling and your boy tried to get in that shower and says, ah, <laughs> oh, yo, I thought she threw me in the lake of fire. It was that hot, okay? I didn't like it. I didn't enjoy it. So, <laughs> so for me to think about doing something or living a life or being judged and that's the end result, I might do something to not go there. Again, starting looking at the end and reverse engineering how I make sure I don't go to that place. Not out of fear, but out of making a decision for my eternity. That is a much different experience than standing at the place of rewards. Right? Romans 2, 5, and 6. But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his, right, when his righteous judgment will be revealed. God will repay each person according to what they have done to those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality. He will give them eternal life. So let's pause there. Let's just look at it this way. We're talking to two different experiences, two different audiences. The room on the right and the room on the left. I'm over here. Thank you for coming to the room on the right, but you didn't win today. If you sat on the left side, everybody on the left, you get $100 today for attending church today. You're not. I'm just saying. <laughs> so for those who seek the glory of God and to honor him and to worship him, you'll be given eternal life. But for those different audience. For those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth, rejecting the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. Not a fun picture. Not a fun picture. Two different groups of people, those in faith and those outside of the faith. Those who experience one thing, those who experience something different. So let's talk about the great white throne. What will a non-believer experience in heaven? And again, hear me out. All of this is theology. All of this is um, exegetical study, interpretation of scripture. Through what lenses are you reading scripture and what are you surmising because of that? It is okay for you to disagree, but I'm just putting out the scriptures. The great white throne of judgment, who is the judge? Christ is the judge. Who is it for? It is for unbelievers. What is the purpose? To settle accounts for those who rebel against God's righteousness. What is the criteria? Everyone who is spiritually dead, who have not put their faith in Jesus, those whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life, will be judged. There will be no defense and no appeal. That's, that's tough, right? There's no lawyers in heaven. There's no one up there who's going to try your case for you. And here's even the hard part. Like, as a parent, you don't get to stand there and defend your kid. But it's not their fault. It's my fault. I didn't raise them in church. I didn't. There's no defense. There's no appeal. Will each person receive equal treatment? Yes. All who stand before the great white throne of judgment will be condemned. But the fire will be hotter for some than others according to what they have done. Will it be fair this time? Yes. Anyone who has rejected God's gift of salvation will receive the due punishment for their sins. So let's take a look at this. Let's break it down because I know this becomes scary. And, and, and that's not my point today. My point is not to like uh, teach you about heaven and to scare you into salvation. Not at all. We're talking about already and not yet. We need to be looking. If the scripture says some things then we need to be aware of it. We need to understand what it says. If there's going to be a judgment, then I need to know what that judgment's about so I can plan correctly to get there. You can create your own path of how you're going to do that. that, that that's what the Bible says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. But check this out. The, the most popular verse in the Bible, many of you know it, John 3.16. How many know John 3.16? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, and whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But sometimes we 
we say John 3.16 or maybe even include John 3.17, but we don't look at John 3.18. So let's take a look at that. John 3.18 through 20 says, Whoever believes in Christ or in him is not condemned. That echoes Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation. But whoever, second audience, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already. There's already condemned. So when they get to heaven to go to that great white throne, the, the condemnation's already there. They're already condemned. They're already convicted. They're already guilty. Because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Verse 19. This is the verdict. That's a law term. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. Pastor Mike, did you share all this to scare us into Christianity? Not at all. Not at all. It's not my heart. That's not my heart at all. I don't believe in fear Christianity. I don't believe to be scared into Christianity. I, I was raised that way, right? Like there was this constant fear that hung over my head. And all it made me do was be a better liar and a better sneak. Right? It just made me be a little bit more intentional about how I snuck around so I didn't get caught and get in trouble, right? It didn't, it didn't actually make me want to come to a loving God because I was afraid that he, if I did, he's still going to beat me. Right? That, that's not what the point of this is. I think that the church has not preached enough about heaven. I think that there was a time where we did, where people talked and, and spoke about the blessed hope and one day being delivered and set free and all that. But, but I don't think that we have enough knowledge as to what these end times may look like. And, and, and hear me out, we're banking our whole eternity, our entire eternity, our afterlife on a book. We should know what the book says, front to back. But most of us don't learn anything front to back. Many of you have, a, have, have an iPhone that you don't even know how half of it works. But you spent $1,500 on this piece of technology that is the center of your universe. And there are functions and there are uh, apps and there are all sorts of things that you have no idea how they work because you never read the manual. You never looked up the details of what comes with that perks and those packages. Some of you have no idea you have these great health care plans and you have these benefits at your job and you have no idea all the perks that you actually have because we don't read the blueprint, right? We don't read the fine print. We don't really read the details and that ideology has crept into the church. We're going to spend all eternity in heaven and we have no idea what the book says. We have no idea what the love letter from heaven actually entails for us. I think that many Christians are being destroyed today for a lack of knowledge. A lack of knowledge. And that's a conviction of mine. So because of that conviction, I believe that a lot of people are being destroyed for lack of knowledge I'm creating a new initiative starting January 3rd, I think it's 3rd, right? January 3rd, 2024. Here at Family Church, we are starting Wednesday night Bible studies. Wednesday night Bible studies. But Wednesday night Bible studies is not going to be your mom and dad's Bible study. This is not a midweek service. There's not going to be praise and worship. There's not going to be lights. There's not going to be any of that. It's legitimately like classroom style teaching. Line upon line, precept upon precept, teachings. They are going to run, and, 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 and I'll tell you why in a second, but it's going to run from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. on Wednesday nights. And I'm going to tell you why it's so long. Because we have partnered with Lancaster Bible College, and if you want to, you can get college credit for the classes that you take here at Family Church on Wednesday nights. You'll get three credit hours per course that you take. Now, do you have to take the college side? Do you have to get credit? No, not at all. It's absolutely free if you don't want any of that. Absolutely. Come, learn. But starting in January, we are going to start at the basics, the fundamentals of Christianity. What is the Bible? The Bible is the inspired word of God, right? 
What was, what's the Bible good for? What does it give us? And we're going to be line upon line studying this thing out uh, for the whole year. We're going to break it up into eight-week courses. You will have to sign up for it, and we ask, if you sign up, show up. Show up to as many of the classes as you can. It's not going to be live streamed. Like I said, it's not a church service. It's classroom. It's teaching. It's the discipleship. I have a conviction that we are supposed to go into all the world and make disciples. Well, how do you make disciples? By teaching them. Listen, every single time Jesus performed miracles, it first said he taught and performed miracles. He taught and perform miracles. And I think that if we want to see the outpour of the Spirit of God, we've got to know what the Word says. So starting in January, we are going to be launching uh, Wednesday night Bible studies. Amen? So what should our response be? In light of this eschaton, in light of the end times, in light of knowing that there's going to be this place of judgment, what should we begin to do now as believers, as Christians, we need to serve God faithfully in light of eternity. You have actually already done the biggest step. You gave your life to Christ. You accepted Jesus Christ. As well. that's, the, that's the biggest step. That's the hurdle. That's the stumbling block. But now we need to begin to live a life that exemplifies that decision. We are urged in Scripture, in light of the final judgment, to not judge others. Man, if, we, if Christians could just do that we would bring more people to the gospel than any other religion. If we'd stop judging, if we stop comparing ourselves, well, I had to stop doing this, they need to stop doing it. Man, that's where the holiness movement went to trash. Right, I believe in holiness, and I believe that the, the holiness movement was great when it started, but when it became uh, constrictive and it became judgmental, they lost their way. We need to build people up because we're living the exemplified life of Christ. Do not judge others in this life. Instead, trust God's perfect wisdom and God's judgment. I get so angry when I hear people say, well, I don't think that this kind of person should be allowed in church. I don't want to sit next to that kind of person. I don't want to sit next to you. Negativity is contagious. Bad attitudes are contagious, man. Like, listen, the moment you disqualify anybody, I would dare say you might have disqualified yourself. Come on, somebody. I don't want that kind of person in my church. Where else do they go than the house of God to find healing and restoration and deliverance? Where do they go? Where, where, where does a person who needs help go? They got to go to a place that gives help. And that's what the church should be. That's our response in this life. Check this scripture out. The Bible says, well, how do we know that someone's a Christian? How do we know that someone's a believer? And Paul writes, someone who has gone from darkness to light. We, we know that someone has transitioned from darkness to light or from death to life if they love their neighbor, if they love others. Woo, man, what a great indicator. Makes you check your heart, right? What should an unbeliever do? In light of the judgment, what should an unbeliever do? Repent. Repent means to you change your thinking and believe the gospel. Believe in Jesus Christ. Not out of fear, but out of faith. Because the word of God is truth. Do not wait. There may not be another chance. The Bible tells us tomorrow is guaranteed to no one. Well, Pastor Mike, what was your hope? Or like, are you going to do like a huge salvation call and you hope that 100 people get saved today? Nope, I'm not doing a salvation call today. I'm going to let you stew on this. I'm going to let you think about this. I'm let you meditate upon it. Next week, right before we do communion, we'll do a salvation call. We'll bring people into the faith. Here was my hope for today. We cannot stand in formation as believers without information. We can't stand in formation without information. And so my hope is to just to bring data, to bring scripture, to bring a conversation to your house that maybe you haven't had before. Even if you go home and you completely tear me apart and tell your family how wrong I am. I love it, awesome. But you're talking, you're talking. 
and you talk about the gospel, you talk about what you believe, and you talk about what you've been taught. Don't, don't, don't just swallow everything you've always been taught because you learned it in Sunday school. Find out what the word of God says to you. What resonates in your spirit? Try to read it without the lenses of what you learned in Bible school. And that's it. That's all I wanted, to bring information at hand, to search your heart for what your response should be. Maybe this becomes something that you begin to study. Maybe it's something that you start a small group. Maybe it changes the perspective of your life and say, well, in light of that, in light of being rewarded in heaven for the works that are done for the gospel, I need to do something for the gospel. I need to be part of something that's life-giving and life-changing to help others around because, because I've been living selfishly. I mean, that's great. That's all my hope is. That's all I wanted to do today was to begin this conversation, say there is a blessed hope for believers, but there is not that blessed hope for someone who doesn't put their faith in Jesus. And doggone, I don't want my neighbor to do that, to go through that. I don't want my friends to experience that. There, there, in light of that, there needs to be an urgency in the heart of every believer. I don't want anybody going to the lake of fire. What can I do to help someone come to the full knowledge of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Father, we thank you for today. We thank you that your word will never return void. It will accomplish what you set it forth to do. Lord, I pray that if I said some things today that are not absolutely true, that are not absolutely theologically correct, I think that I'll stand in judgment for it one day, but it'll burn up in the fire. But Lord, I pray that we created a conversation today that would spur, keep going through our households and, and, and maybe create a conviction within us to live a life that's honoring and pleasing to you. As we leave here today, Lord, I bless everyone the sound of my voice. They're the head and not the tail, above and never beneath. Everything they set their hands to will prosper and be successful in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you. Have a great weekend. Thanks for watching today's message. My name is Pastor John Mark. And if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. We want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is to take your next step in your journey. We'd love to help you do that. And you can head over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started.